everyone. I'm Denise Rose of The Happy Vegan Couple. If this is your first time with me, I'd just like to share first that along with my partner, Georgie, what we love to do is help people transition from animal and processed food diets to one of whole food, plant food, because it's so great for your health and the planet and the animals. So we uh, do classes in Tucson, Arizona on eating plants. And we also have a YouTube channel and a Facebook page, and we create cooking videos for whole food plant-based recipes, really healthy recipes. So you can always go to our YouTube channel, Happy Vegan Couple, and check out all the recipes and cooking videos we have. And we show you step-by-step -step cooking instructions. So if you don't know how to cook, we show you. Georgie is the cook, and he does a great job of it. And I'm also doing now transition stories because what better way to help people transition than to learn from those who've already done it it's you know, just a journey to something new it's not difficult really it's just different and i think if we hear from more people about how they did it it will encourage more people to try it on their own and that's what we want to do so i'm so excited to share with you a young man today 25 years old, Garrett Skirt, and he lives so far away from me, all the way in New Zealand. Isn't that amazing that we can zoom to New Zealand from Tucson, Arizona? Well, Gareth became a plant-based eater just a little over three years ago. And his motivation, he had a bunch of excess weight on his body and he wanted to get that off and he was concerned about health issues. And he was a cheeseaholic. I bet a lot of you can relate to that, right? So hard to give up that cheese. And so, but he wanted to do it. And so he decided to go vegan. But what he realized after a while was going vegan isn't really the same thing as whole food plant-based eating. And once he heard about that, then things started accelerating in terms of his health benefits. And he said the weight really started dropping off after he got on the whole food plant-based bandwagon. So we're really excited to learn about the journey that he took. And the other great thing is Gareth, along with his wife, Jackie, they're so excited about what they've been doing and eating and the health benefits that they started advocating to other people in New Zealand. And they wrote a couple of cookbooks and they're, they're just doing even more. And so we'll hear about that in our conversation today too. So before I bring Gareth on, I just wanna show you some of his pictures of his transformation because that is just always so interesting. So let me bring that up and get that for you. And let's take a look. There you go. So there is Gareth on the left, like a little over three years ago before he went on the plant-based diet. And look at him now. Isn't that an amazing transformation? I mean, 25 years old, I told him that the picture on the left, he doesn't look like, well, he's 25 now. He was even younger then. He doesn't look like that to me. And here's a couple other pictures that he actually sent me. So it's okay that we, he decided to share these pictures with me. And you can see the progression as well. And uh, it's just, look at the difference in the face, right? I, I, I don't know if my picture is covering up his face on the right, but you know, you saw it in the other one. And then finally, I'll just show you this. Here's a couple pictures of him and his adorable wife, Jackie. And on the left, that's when they got married. And that was just after they started to become vegan. And you can see how he still had quite a bit of weight on him. And I, I, I am assuming he has some maybe Scottish heritage because of what he's wearing. And then you see him on the right with one of their cookbooks. And you can see he's already been slimming down there. So <clears throat> I'm really excited to bring Gareth on and uh, from this wonderful transformation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unmute him and we're gonna start our conversation. Gareth, are you there? Yeah, thank you so, so much for having me on this. It still shocks me to see my own photos, I must say. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sure. And, and I mean, and you look so wonderful. I mean, just such a cutie pie you are. 25 years old and you just, your face is just so fresh and bright and 
I just love it. So anyways, so let's hear about your journey. So why don't we start with back three years ago, like when you first said, I'm going to change the way I eat. Where did that come from? And what was going on in your life that even gave you that thought that maybe that was something you wanted to do? Well, um, for me, it was, it was my wife who really helped get the ball rolling first because she had multiple health conditions at the time. And uh, we were living on the road in New Zealand in a little camper van. We were down in Southlands, which is um, not the most, most, most plant-based friendly place. It's getting there now, but she was watching a documentary, um, What the Health at the time, and I was sitting in the, the other side of the van and I was, I was busy playing games on my computer and I had one ear out so I could uh, listen to her, you know, if she had to say anything to me. And um, yeah, it was What the Health came on. And my granddad had just been diagnosed with dementia at the time. And they brought up a study between meat and dairy and how it can affect things like Alzheimer's and dementia. And it just got the gears turning for me. It, it was just, I, I looked at what my granddad was eating and he came from French uh, heritage. So, you know, it was always wine, garlic, cheese. Um, he, he used to put so much cheese and like wine in his soup. Uh, he, he did some bizarre things, but we loved him for it. But yeah, seeing what he used to eat and then see him get this condition, I was like, well, even if that, um, that study turned out not to be true, I think it's worth a try, you know, with changing my eating habits. And I was 127 kilo. I'm not sure what that is in pounds for your um, American you viewers. Had, yeah, I think you had told me that maybe when you started, like, let's see, I had some notes from you. I don't know if this is the same, that 122 kilograms is 269 pounds for us here. Yeah. In, so in our, I was so yeah. 22 and uh, that sort of weight, you know despite living on the road and having this nomadic life, you know, we're always getting out and about what I was eating was just keeping that weight on so much. And as you said before, I, I was a serious cheeseaholic. I could put a whole block of cheese into one pasta bake. And I was quite happy with that. And thinking back to it, I, I just, I can't believe I used to do that to myself. Right. Well, but, but of course you probably didn't realize then, Oh my God, all that saturated fat, all that salt, all the hormones in the cheese, right? You probably didn't um, know all that. No, of course I didn't. And um, it was only with Jackie looking into what she was eating due to her health conditions at the time that it got me thinking about um, what am I eating too? Because that's the thing. She, I wasn't necessarily, I was overweight, um, but I didn't think of myself as unhealthy. I still thought I was eating a standard diet and I was a bit big, but you know, that was just jolliness, you know, that, that wasn't anything too bad. And yeah, I, I was so glad that she delved into that because it was five days later at first I told her you know I'm, I'm happy to support you and your plant-based journey and your journey towards veganism but that's not for me you know I'm meat and cheese man you know and five days later it was just that watching that documentary or in my case I wasn't even watching it myself I was just listening out of one ear and just the right fact at the right time just got everything turning and made me want to look after myself you know I want to be there in the future when I have grandkids down the road you know I I don't want to have dementia or Alzheimer's and I feel selfish in saying that. Um, but you know, that's the thing. Like we want to be healthy for the ones we love. We want to spread the, that love through health. Right. Well, absolutely. And how, how long did your grandfather's dementia go on for? Because it can be a long disease when you have that. Yeah. And well, unfortunately um, he passed away just a few days ago. Um, oh. And Luckily, he was in his happy bubble for like the last two and a half years, you know, and it was only just recently um, he started having strokes and then he stopped being able to respond. But um, my granddad, he was always Jack the lad. And yeah, for the for a good two years, you know, he was just happy as Larry in his own little world. You know, he got he reverted back to how he was when he was a lad in the day. So, um, yeah, all the widows had to watch out around him. <laughs> But um, yeah, it, it, it was it was fortunate that it didn't last too long once he got to that unresponsive stage and once he was actually trapped in his body. Um, but, you know, I, I have him to thank for, you know, me being here and living healthier, really. You know, uh, Gareth, I really understand what that's like. So my mother <clears throat> had dementia uh, and she had a much, much worse run of it. My mother was literally lying in a bed full time 
for at least 15 years with dementia. It took that long. Well, and it started before that. I mean, she wasn't in the bed the whole time in the beginning. It was accelerated after my dad died. And uh, so I had to watch my mom for all those years, lie in a bed with her mind waning, you know, a little bit at a time, having no quality of life. And, um, and at that point, for most of it, I didn't know anything about the potential connection of food and brain. And, uh, but I've learned a lot since, and I don't know if you know, um, actually two neurologists from the States, their names are, uh, they call themselves Team Sharzai, Aisha and Dean Sharzai. They're neurologists and they're big advocates of whole food plant-based eating to prevent cognitive decline, dementia, Alzheimer's. They're big on telling everybody that if you don't want to go this way, begin to change your diet, you know, and get rid of all that saturated fat from the animal foods and all the other, you know, toxic things people do. So, you know, it, it, what you learned was, you know, really important at that time and, and certainly made a difference, you know, hopefully for you that that won't be your, your, your uh, journey. Yeah, so, I'm, so, I'm so sorry you had to go through that with um, your mother, you know, and I, yeah, we were quite lucky with what, how it went with my granddad, but um, yeah, I'll be sure to check those, uh, the, the team. Um, team Sharzai. Sharzai. I want to say Shiraz. Yeah, S-H-E-R-Z-A-I. They have their first book out on um, uh, Alzheimer's prevention. They're writing a second book and they have YouTube channel. They're all on Facebook. They're huge advocates that if you really want to protect your brain, going whole food plant-based is the way to go. So, you know, I, I just appreciate them so much because after witnessing my own struggle, you know, with my mother and how sad that was, you know, and like your grandfather, my mom was mostly happy in her dementia. But again, you know, she was just lying in a bed. And so, it, you know, I've actually writ, wrote out for my will when my time comes, though it's not legal here in our country, but I, I'm like, even if I'm happy with dementia, that isn't what I want. I don't want to be alive like that if I can't have a quality of life. It's just not what I want. But hopefully the way I eat, that's not going to happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. So let's get back to you, though, because that's why we're here today. So when you started, what was your game plan, you know, did you think? Like, you, okay, so five days later, you said, I'm going to go vegan. But uh, did you have any idea, like, you're going to go fully vegan or partially vegan? Or how were you thinking about it? Well, for me, it was, it's always all or nothing. Um, ah. So we just went a hundred percent straight from the start. And of course we had a, um, a few errors when the, the big learning curve is reading labels and then finding out they put milk products in so many silly things. But yeah, we just went a hundred percent. And as I said before, we were living in a tiny camper van. We had this miniature little fridge and it just made things so much easier because um, I've always been a bit of a food hygiene nut when it came to things like pork and chicken. I would never have them in these tiny little fridges and uh, just because of cross-contamination and things like that. At least you don't get that with celery and carrots. Um, but yeah, so we just cleared all that stuff out. We gave, um, we had quite a few other people staying around us uh, camping as well. So we just sort of, you know, have some cheese, have some bacon, have some eggs, you know, uh, rather give them to someone than, than they go to waste, you know. But yeah, just 100% from the start. It was just sort of cheese was the only sort of slight hurdle, but um, I've got some good tips for how to get over cheese that work for me anyway. And um, that's basically just to shift your, your primary diet. Because if you, like in Western countries, we eat a lot of things that you tend to stock up with cheese. You know, you load up your pasta with cheese, you have your nachos and cheese, you have your cheeseburger. You basically, for us, we shifted towards more Asian sort of um, like Chinese, Asian, uh, Indonesian, uh, Indian cuisine, things like that, which you wouldn't normally load up with cheese. And just doing that for the first two weeks is a great way to explore all the different plants and uh, fruits and all these wonderful things that you've been ignoring whilst eating the meat diet. And at the same time, you know, get you away from those sort of um, those horrible habits. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you mentioned a moment ago that you had some tips you learned about 
that helped you, you know, get away from being a cheeseaholic. So can you share maybe a few of those with us? Yeah, well, the main one, as I say, is to, to shift your diet away from those your usual comfort foods, generally a lot of Western foods, um, yeah, that you load up. That, that's the biggest one is, you know, if you can change your usual habits, because um, going plant-based or vegan, it is a big overhaul on your life, you know. Um, as you can see, you know, it overhauls <laughs> in a, a brilliant way down the track, but you've got to, even if you want to come back to those comfort foods, like in the, the, a lot of the cooking we do now, we go back and revisit a lot of our old favorites. I think it's very important that that first sort of fortnight to steer away, go to things that you wouldn't normally load up with meat and cheese. So curries are absolutely brilliant for this because a lot of the time, um, when you have a good curry, the meat is more for a texture thing. You know, um, a lot of them have coconut cream already, so you can easily just add in some more veggies. Um, I really love tofu and curries. Uh, tofu is a bit of a stickler with many people, but I love putting it in there now. Um, or even going to more Asian foods like, you know, different noodle bowls. Um, we've been on a mad sushi buzz lately, and, um, you know, you can do all these wonderful things. You can eat really great food for those first couple of weeks, and it'll help you get over that craving because you're not, you're not trying to recreate those same um, experiences straight away, you know. Another tip I'd have would be to stay away from um, processed, um, those sort of store-bought burger patties or vegan cheeses and stuff like that, just for the first couple of weeks. Because for me as a cheeseaholic, when I tried to compare even the best sort of vegan cheese out here compared to the horrible cow's um, baby growth formula that I was eating before, it, it isn't on the same level, you know, they're a really good substitute when you're down the line, but when you try and, you know, you direct comparing, it's, it's a very hard playing field, you know, you, you're putting yourself on an uphill battle. So for the first couple of weeks, I recommend staying away from those products and try and learn from scratch. That's what we did. We sort of started making our own burgers from beans and lentils and um, all the good stuff, you know. But if you can learn to do it from scratch for those first couple of weeks as well, it's just going to make everything so much easier for you. And vegan cooking and well, plant-based cooking, it's really simple. It's just, it's just getting your, your mind out of the old, um, the old habits, really. Right. So, um, so one challenge, of course, was that those cravings for the cheese and trying to figure out what to do. Were, were there any other major challenges, you know, in the beginning or, you know, in the first year or two as you were doing this? Um, not really. Like, I, I, the one other craving that I had, and it's, it's, it's abhorrent to me now, is, um, is ribs. Like, I used to love ribs when I was a carnist, and I remember having, I had one of those smoker's dreams, you know, where, you know, <laughs> my pillow had turned into this rack of ribs and I wake up covered in drool. Um, and I've been trying to recreate that with uh, carrots and what else do, do I stick like a chopstick in it and then roast it like that. I'm, I'm still trying to work on making a vegan version for myself. So I've got something to gnaw on. Um, but yeah, it, it's really, it's not that hard. Well, it wasn't that hard for me personally. I have given up things like smoking as well in the past. So, you know, going cold turkey is my, my preference to giving up these things. But when you've got the mindset for it, it's no problem. And for me, I personally advocate um, going towards a vegan diet as opposed to just a plant-based most of the time, because um, with the vegan diet, it means that you've got those ethics, which are also going to keep you um, on the plant-based path. Like for me in these last few weeks, I've had a real sort of difficult time. I've been binge eating a lot of stuff I shouldn't be, but I, because I've gone for the vegan path as opposed to just, just plant-based, um, I never st stray away from just plant products. You know, if I was just on the plant-based thing, I probably would have gone out and got a cheeseburger. Um, but because I've got those ethics to back it up, it really keeps me on track. And yeah, I've now, last couple of weeks, Oreos have been my, um, my really bad treat. So I I'm going cold turkey on them as well at the moment. Yeah, the, the little vegan junk food is out there <laughs> calling for you, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, well, how does the, um, well, let's talk for a moment before we get more into the cooking and what you guys are eating. I want to get into that more, but 
just in terms of the health benefits that you've experienced, talk a little bit about that, you know, the weight loss, what that was like, and, and, and you know, anything else that you might have noticed. I mean, you're so young, so it's not quite the same as somebody who might be, you know, much later in life and who already have their diagnoses of type 2 diabetes or heart disease, whatever. But, you know, what have you found for yourself? Well, um, yeah, as we said at the start, I was 122 kilo and that's not a good weight for a 22 year old. You know, I was getting to the stage where, you know, I, I couldn't see things anymore, um, which is not a problem 22 year olds should have. And I was just, um, I was always so lethargic, you know, uh, it was really hard. We used to do a lot of walking for some of the work that we do with a um, travel magazine, but, you know, I was always so worn out, you know, and um just just for going to the plant-based and the vegan um you know i started losing a bit of weight i got down to i think it's about 90 maybe 100 kilo you know um actually i think it's probably more around 100 kilos once i went whole food plant-based like the real uh big changes started happening but just going with the plant-based you know the weight was dropping off of course i felt a lot better i had a lot more energy um once again it's not a problem people of my age should have but so many of us do because we're just filling ourselves with this inefficient fuel as um one of my heroes dr clapper likes to say you know it's like putting a diesel in a gasoline car you know you're burning on the wrong stuff so yeah just for me i was just feeling a lot more active um weight started dropping off um the brain function was a lot better too you know because that's the thing when you you're always so tired and lethargic because you're trying to process this this horrible stuff in your gut you know your brain's not functioning as well so um i really felt you know i've started to pick up a lot more on you know just brain activity as we've talked about quite a bit so yeah. far were, were you into um any any other kind of major exercise or was it mostly walking that you did no i was just just walking um that's been one of the things a lot of people don't um they don't really believe but most of the time just going out for a walk about half an hour an hour just just a casual sort of walk you know that really does make a huge difference just a little bit of movement a day can just really turn things around i used to be big into skateboarding and mountain biking all those things back in the day but um now since being vegan it's mainly just been walking and stuff and, right and you know it's interesting to hear that because you know some people just think oh i'm you know to lose the weight i gotta go spend all these hours at the gym and do all this and you know most of our doctors tell us, I follow a lot of doctors in the plant-based community, and while exercise is critical for our health, you know, they're like, you're not going to really lose a massive amount of weight just the exercise route, you know, if you're still eating all those other foods. And, you know, and, and that is pretty much, I think, what people find. And uh, so you didn't even do all that much of, you know, intense exercise, like hanging out at the gym forever, and you still lost the weight. Yeah, I, I think I must be allergic to gyms, but it's um this is why we see some of these athletes so all of a sudden they, they seem fit as a fiddle, they're out there all the time and then they just drop dead and it's because they're filling themselves with the wrong fuel. And it's such a shame to see and I, I've got many friends as well who keep on eating this horrible stuff and they go down to the gym and work out harder and harder to try and achieve the same goal that I managed to do with just walking and eating the right things. Right. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you guys eat and who does the cooking and, you know, what is that, how does that work out in your family with you and Jackie? Well, um, I got to say, going plant-based and vegan really invigorated cooking again with me. Beforehand, Jackie used to do most of the cooking, um, but now we do it as a team. Um, it's sort of one night or the other, one of us will cook. I've been doing a lot of the cooking lately, um, just with Jackie being unwell. But um, yeah, it's just, it's, it really invigorated me because just learning about all these different plants and what I could be doing with them. Um, picking up things like eggplants, which beforehand, they might come up in a ratatouille, but, you know, I always thought, you know, that's just some side vegetable, you know, I, I don't need that. But now I get excited about ingredients like that because there's so many more things that we can do with them. And you know, with a, a meat-based diet and stuff like that, you maybe have, what, six, seven different types of meat. When you go to a full veg, veggie-based diet, you've got, what, thousands of different varieties of things and different berries and seeds and nuts and beans, legumes. Um, but yeah, so I do a lot of the cooking. Jackie does a lot of cooking. We sort of on and off in between us, but um, 
yeah, we, we keep everything nice and simple and we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of recipes for our Facebook page, which is camper van kitchen. And, um, yeah, everything we try to do, we try to keep it with basic, simple ingredients because when we're traveling around New Zealand, where we started out in Southland, tofu was an exotic thing, you know, like, um, it's a real meat and dairy capital out here. So we always use base ingredients to make something wonderful and just so wonderful what you can make from them. Wow. So maybe you could give us like a day in the life of Gareth and Jackie. Like how do you start? What's your like first meal of the day? Um, most of the time now it tends to be avocado on toast. Um, for me, I add some tahini and a bit of, um, I don't know if you have it out in the States, um, an equivalent of Marmite or Vegemite. It's like a, it's like a yeast sort of spread thing. Yeah, it's, you know, I, 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 there, it might be. I'm not positive because I don't eat that, but I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, I know England, I think, has stuff like that. They probably yeah. have it somewhere here. You could get it online. <laughs> but yeah, like um, and so Marmite. Like, and is your bread, what kind of bread are you eating Your toast for your toast? Well, I always go for as much the best sort of whole meal one I can find. Um, unfortunately, out here in New Zealand, they they haven't really picked up too much on that in the supermarket. So there's only sort of one or two I can get. For quite a, um, a long period, when I started going towards whole food plant-based, I started eating a lot more gluten-free bread because Jackie is celiac. Um, oh, right. And she and, has to be off of that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I started eating a lot more of that. And that was quite helpful at the start because it got me eating less because it was so much more expensive. But now um, taking the advice from, you know, Dr. Clapper, Dr. Greg, all the, the wonderful plant-based doctors out there, um, I always try and go for the proper, you know, whole grain, whole meal bread, not one of these ones, which is supposedly whole meal, which is white bread with some brown stuff thrown in it. <laughs> right, right, right. So you know how to, you know how to, you, the label has to say whole wheat, a hundred percent or something like that. Not just, yeah. wheat, right. Wheat, wheat is white. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that, so, so toast uh, with avocado for breakfast, anything else go along with that? Um, usually just that for breakfast. Normally Jackie will have a bowl of rocket, um, or, um, I think you call a it a rocket. Yeah. Um, the, What's that? The, um, I think it's called arugula. I, oh, arugula. You yeah. Can little green, uh, the le little green leafy green. That's a little spicy. Yeah. That's the one. So, um, yeah, we absolutely love that. And, um, we also, we've got some sorrel in the garden where we are at the moment. That's another one that has that real nice tang to it. So I'm um, trying to have, you know, a couple of handfuls of that. Um, and will she, just, will she just eat eat the arugula just plain or does she do something with it? Usually just um, eats it plain. I, I Quite often I see her in the fridge, you know, she just just munching it. <laughs> wow. I, th I think it's wonderful. Well, I think we've had a few batches of uh, arugula that's been... I think it's dependent on when it's picked on how real peppery and fiery it is. Like we got a few bags um, from a organic one, a little organic shop down the road a little while back and yeah, it was blow your socks off stuff. So that wasn't quite breakfast for us, but when it comes to lunches and things like that, we tend to normally it's something like leftovers or we might make a quick and easy veggie soup. Um, we make it all oil free and just whatever's in the pantry really. Um, or oh, oh, we do actually, uh, we used to do a lot of salads and stuff like that. Usually, um, once again, raid the fridge, see what leafy greens we've got in there, check some maybe raw mushrooms, uh, tomatoes, cucumber, capsicum, um, or you might call them peppers out there as opposed to capsicum. Um, and then we love chucking in things like jalapenos, um, olives, um, pickles. I love pickles. Pickles uh -huh. are, the, are the bee's knees. <laughs> And yeah, checking stuff like some turmeric on it, some nuts and seeds, um, just some, if we've got whatever's in the pantry once again. Right, but let's, I'd like to just talk, I mean, just to hear a little bit more of just what some of the dishes are. I mean, I kind of feel like we're talking about ingredients, but like how you pull them together. So like, what are you guys going to have later today? Do you know yet? Oh, that's a hard decision. Um, <laughs> or maybe well, talk about yesterday. Well, um, yeah, well, yesterday we had um, we had some baked kumra, um, which is sweet potato, uh, the New Zealand, um, yeah, we call it kumra out here. And we have that, we did it uh, based off Rip's, um, Rip Ethelstein's, um, oh, 
the words escape me at the moment. Jackie's currently just reading the um, Engine 2 cookbook right now. Um, but yeah, we did the baked sweet potato and then we had some uh, black beans, some arugula, uh, capsicum, some mango, and can't quite remember. Oh, I did a tahini sauce um, with uh, Dijon and, um, and some balsamic vinegar. And yeah, so I just, I, I butter up the the sweet potato with the tahini mix and then add in all the other stuff on top. When it comes to actually formulating a lot of these recipes, um, I have no idea what I'm doing most of the time. You know, it's just, I you have the ingredients, I chuck them together. I guess I must have some basic knowledge back there that helps bring it together. But somehow we've managed to do hundreds of recipes between the two of us. Luckily, Jackie is, tends to be the recipe writer. Um, I tend to be the, the maniac in the kitchen. And it's just, um, it's just over time I've built a, a bit of a knowledge of what works well with what. And we spent quite a lot of time. We used to watch um, quite a few cooking shows and even, you know, kind of meaty ones. Um, one that I found was really helpful was um, Salt, Acid, Fat and Heat. I think I've said that in the right order. It was on Netflix and it was just so going into the basics of when you, when you bring it together a dish, you know, you want that salty element. You need that, that tangy um, and then the fat and you know, a bit of spice to bring it all together and just watching these things and trying to think of how I can incorporate that with plants instead of um, corks and all the other uh -huh. horrible stuff that they use. But yeah, for most of the time, I don't know what on earth I'm doing. <laughs> I, I just jump in the kitchen and uh, get it going. But yeah, it's, it's when we put it into books that Jackie puts my thoughts into, um, in, into practice. <laughs> so do you, do you at all feel like, um, when you think about what you want to eat throughout the day, do you ever feel like, well, I want to have a certain amount of legumes or whole grains or these veggies? Do you have any of those kind of thoughts that guide you or not really? Um, well, when we started out, we used an app, um, which I, I'm going to have to ask Jackie. What's the name of the app? Daily Dozen, that's the one. Michael Greger, <laughs> um, right? Yeah, from Michael Greger. That was really helpful at the start. And I think that's what um, helped us now to formulate a lot of things because once you use the Daily Dozen for about a month, you know, you soon get ingrained that, oh, I haven't had my legumes today. Oh, I haven't had my nuts today. Um, right. That was a really helpful one. Yeah, I'm actually glad to hear that because when I teach, uh, you know, in my classes, uh, in my slideshow that I've created, I have several slides talking about the daily dozen from Dr. Greger, you know, and I go through that because I also thought that that could be very helpful for people, you know, and even for me, you know, uh, when I started really, uh, I became a vegetarian when I was very young, you know, at age actually uh, 21 or 22 is when I stopped eating animal bodies. And uh, but I never really knew the health information, you know, that I know now since I've studied it. But Dr. Greger's app, you know, just was like, oh, he suggests like three servings of beans a day. So like if it's whole beans, that's a cup and a half. So I was like, okay, how do I get my beans in every day, you know? So now I actually even eat beans in the morning along with my oatmeal. So I have like one serving right there, and you know, try to get them throughout the day. So yeah, I think that can be very helpful. He's got his like tablespoon of flaxseed in the daily dozen. Yeah, that really helped uh, when it came to making salads and stuff. As I was saying earlier with the ingredients, you know, we started chucking the nuts and stuff on it and there was some like pumpkin seeds just to, so then we could tick another one off on our, on our daily dozen list. And even adding things like, yeah, the turmeric, the flax. Um, there's so many great things that you can just chuck onto dishes or into dishes just to give yourself an added little tick for the day and um, also get that good nutrition. Yes, right. Um, and so um, talk a little bit about um, how you went from the vegan understanding to the whole food plant-based, you know, how did that learning come to you? Because there really is quite a difference. As you said, you could be a vegan and have the ethics that you don't want to, you know, have animals suffer, but you could just be eating Oreos all day long, right? Or white bread. Uh, so how did uh, you get yeah. To the whole food plant-based part well um it was after we were writing our cookbook um easy and delicious everyday vegan uh vegan recipes for busy people um we we're in the process of writing that and we started learning a few things about you know cooking oil free um because jackie has a chronic pain condition and it turns out that oil really affects her 
when we eat something that with oil, it flares up a lot of pain things for her. So we started learning a little bit about that, but it was literally a week after we finished writing the cookbook fully that we met someone called uh, Stephanie Wynn and she has a, a page called moving, moving health forward. And she's absolutely wonderful. And she invited us around for dinner and she made a whole food plant-based Mac and cheese. And we still make that today now because it is just so wonderful, but she just really laid it out, you know, why we shouldn't be uh, eating the oil and stuff like that. Um, why we shouldn't be eating the processed stuff. And um, I recently talked, uh, talked to Joey Carbstrong, the uh, prominent Australian activist, and he brings up a good point of it's always the messenger. Sometimes you'll hear the right information, but it comes from the wrong person. So we'd watch Dr. Clapper, Dr. Gregor and all so, so many things, but it wasn't until we had someone right there in front of us sort of showing us how easy it was and um, how easy it was to cook oil free, you know, just with a splash of water in the pan or some stock um, that it really just opened our eyes up. And after that, we we're sort of like, why didn't we learn this like a month before where we could have made the whole cookbook whole food plant based? Um, Instead, it's just um, plant-based, the cookbook, but it does, it's a good sort of transition point because as we were learning, as we went through that, we started making all things all free. So it's a, it a good transitioning point, but yeah, we wish we'd known that so much earlier and yeah, hitting that um, whole food plant-based on the head. We spent the next week just coming up with all different things. I made whole food plant-based um, pancakes with banana and stuff like that. Um, and trying to cook them oil free for the first time, I was really quite nervous, eh? Because I was always used to slapping some butter in the pan or slapping some oil, you know, once it went plant-based and having, not having to worry about things sticking, but learning to cook uh, with just water and stuff like that was, it was a big how learning curve. Do, how did you do the pancake one? Because that I think is hard for a lot of people because they feel, you know, the pancake is going to stick to the pan. So you, you no. have, do you have a way that you found that, that you can avoid that? It's, um, I think I want a two stick. Um, I've already done it once or twice, but it, once again, it's just having that, uh, the pan nice and hot and then just having that little splash of water. So, so you're not steaming your food, you know, you're not trying to bo boil your pancakes, but with that one, I think a, a good non-stick one uh, really helps. What we do a lot of the time now is it won't work with pancakes, I don't think, but uh, we try to use things like uh, air fryer or uh, oven bake a lot of things now because then we can, uh, we've got some of those silicon baking sheets. Right. If if folks out there haven't got silicon baking sheets, they're well worth getting because they're amazing and you're not wasting all this um, baking parchment. But yeah, you can just line something, chuck it on, don't have to worry about it sticking too much. And um, yes, it's a difficult one. I still haven't mastered um, oil-free cooking just yet. You know, I, I couldn't I couldn't advise too much on it, but you know, it's worth investing in things like a good non-stick frying pan because we. I'm I'm one who. Um, you saw me in my kilt earlier. I don't, I, I'm Welsh originally, so I don't have the Scottish heritage, but I mm. think I might do when it comes to uh, money because I can be uh, tight as a drum when it comes <laughs> to spending. And um, I, I always balk at, you know, um, I'm going to invest in cooking equipment. But the thing is, we cook three meals a day, most of us, you know, it's worth investing in because it's like a good bed, you know. You're in it for a good percentage of your life, so it's worth investing in some of these things. Right. I wanted to ask you a, a question about the oil, and because you said that Jackie found that when she would eat oil, she would have more pain. It was probably creating inflammation or something. I was wondering, was that variety of oils, you know, including olive oil um, or just some oils? It, it's uh, generally all oils have an effect, but um, some are worse than others. Um, so canola oil um, is really bad, whereas sunflower oil can sort of, you know, she can be all rightish on it. She'll get a bit of bloating and stuff from it. But yeah, you don't think about this. Like even the oil was having an effect and with her cutting out that and going towards whole food plant-based, she was able to drop a number of medications that she was taking um, because she wasn't having the same levels of pain and inflammation that was being caused by this food. And it, once again, you know, that's from, that was at plant-based, I was at a vegan um, diet already. So just going the whole foods, the next step, you know, really improve things for her health and my health. Right. You know, I also know um, of a doctor in the States, her name is Linda Carney. And uh, she tells people that 
um, she used to have terrible asthma and it wasn't until she she was whole food plant-based but she, uh, she until she gave up the oil that she her asthma really went into remission and she didn't deal with it anymore she really felt that w the oil the little bit of oil she might have had still was a you know a problem there so uh, you know there's a there's a lot of discussion about oil in the plant-based community there's some different opinions about it but it's valuable to hear that for some people it can really make a difference you know to eliminate it and of course for anybody who has extra weight on their body oil is so caloric right yeah. so i bet i bet you i found that when you started le leaving the oil out i bet your weight came off more yeah that's when the weight really started to drop um yeah so i'm i am now 87 kilo i think um so i i've and lost you don't know a lot what that is in, in pounds do you i don't have that number oh, in front of me. um I don't, sorry. Um, okay, that's all right. <laughs> but um, yeah, dropping the oil was a huge thing. I did also drop um, refined sugars and stuff like that. I used to drink a lot of coffee with sugar in it or more sugar with coffee in it. Um, but I really do feel it was the oil because we used to um, do a lot of roast, roast veggies and we'd cover them in oil. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's just, when you think about it, it is just fat, you know, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, good fat, fat is fat. <laughs> right. You're going to be fat. You are what you eat. So um, if people want to lose weight, that, that's probably one of the biggest things I'd say, you know, is, is try and drop that oil. It, you don't know what effects it's going to have. And when you are trying to drop it, a recipe, not a recipe, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, ingredients list on things. It's so much more important to go check in that because oil is another sneaky one. They put it into so many weird and wonderful things. Even your your loaves of bread, they put quite a bit of oil into the, some of those. So um, yeah, it's a sneaky one. You got to, yeah. you got to get that one. Right. So in your little book that you held up though, that's your latest book, right? Yeah. Well, this is our one and only physical um, cookbook. We've done a previous couple of eBooks and stuff like that, but yeah, this is the physical one. Yeah. It's a, it's a great cover. So what are a couple of your favorite recipes from that book that you would recommend to people? Oh, <laughs> now that's a hard one because for us, this book, um, it was just the culmination of so many of our favorite recipes um, over the over the sort of year or two. And um, probably one of my favorites will be the, the sweet and sour tofu. Now I'm still trying to work out a way to do that uh, whole food plant-based. It is plant-based, of course, but um, we use quite a bit of sugar and stuff like that in it. Um, that's an absolute brilliant one. Actually, there's a photo... Just in uh -huh. the middle there. Uh -huh, the middle. Um, Have you tried maybe using dates like the Dr. Gregor way? No, no, I haven't sweetener? tried that one yet. So, um, you know, because he's always like, you're going to use sweetener, you know, make sure that fiber is attached to it. So that's why he'll talk about making date syrup out of like measled dates or another kind of date and seeing about trying to use that as your sweetener. So, you know, I don't know how that would work in that dish, but you might try it because that's okay. what we, we want the fiber to be with the, that sweetener. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to try that. You know, anything Dr. Re uh, Dr. Gregor recommends is always, always worth a try. Um, yeah, that'd be really interesting to try. Another one that um, I really enjoy, and actually um, a lot of the people who bought the book enjoy, is our beet loaf, um, which was actually a failed um, burger recipe. Uh, we were trying to make uh, these burgers, and we, we added in some beetroot and stuff like that to give them that sort of that pinky sort of color to try and, you know, mimic a, a, a normal burger. But we ended up having this sort of sloppier mixture that, that we then put into a meatloaf tin. And it's, I absolutely love it because we can make um, a couple of beetloaf and that's your sandwiches for the week. Um, you can chuck it into all sorts of things. Uh, you can chuck it in a burger, whatever you like. And um, yeah, that, that was one uh, re Western accidental recreation that um, is absolutely fantastic for me. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that how healthy beets are. If I'm remembering correctly, they're really good for lowering, lowering blood pressure, really good for like blood circulation. So it's not something that a lot of people maybe eat on a regular basis, but it would be advantageous. Yeah. There's um, another sort of key part of our book was the sources. And I think a lot of people are once, once you go plant-based or, um, you soon realize that it's usually the sauce that makes a dish. 
often you know your your meats and your cheeses are more a textural element as opposed to you know the real flavor bomb and so we've made a we've got quite a few sauces in here at the end and one of them is a wasabi wrecking ball and um that one just you know it really knocks your socks off you know it's one of those sauces that you just need a little bit in a salad and stuff like that and Oh, it is good fun. You, I, I absolutely love wasabi and it's always great when you have company, you know, to wait for that wasabi moment where everyone sort of cringes. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. A lot of people know that from <clears throat> probably from sushi, that they yeah. might give you a little wasabi with that. Yeah. So if people wanted to get that book, if, if people in America, is there a way they can get that book from somebody who wrote it in New Zealand? Well, um, it is online in places like uh, Book Depository. I'm not sure if it's on Amazon or not. Um, I'll have to get and look that up. But um, if you search for well, Easy and Delicious, and I highly recommend um, searching our names, either Gareth Skirt or my wife, Jackie Norman, um, just due to there's a lot of Easy and Delicious books out there. So if you search it with one of our names, with it, it'll come up a lot easier. Um, but it is on uh, online realty, realtors like uh, Book Depository. We're currently waiting on a second print of it. So we don't have any, um, this is the only copy of which is promised to my mum that we have physically at the moment. Um, but in due time, if you follow us on our um, Facebook page, Camper Van Kitchen, we hopefully might have some more in the future um, that we can you know, sign and send out and stuff like that. But otherwise, yeah, Book Depository is a really good one. We've just used that to get, let's say we've got the Engine 2 cookbook, it arrived this morning um from from the state so we know it goes both ways so that's a really good place to check it out great and, and you know i love the title because <clears throat> excuse me so many people like who aren't on this way of eating they just don't believe that it could be easy and delicious right they just like easy is like they think this is going to be the most complicated thing in the world but that's not what you found out no well we started out in our van our little mazda bongo um, which is, you know, it's, it's not a, a, not a full blown camper van. It's, it's a small sort of like tradesperson's van. And, you know, we lived in that for three years and we were able to cook all these dishes in there. Um, we had to get things like a bench top oven to do some of them, but for the main, well, yeah, we developed all those recipes in tiny conditions. And as I said earlier, we always try and do things with the most simple, basic ingredients. So when we're living on the road, it means we can go from one time to the next and still be able to cook the dish that we want because we haven't asked you to get the, the finest sprig from the furthest valley. And there's nothing I hate more than reading a cookbook and they give you all these weird and wonderful ingredients that sound like you have to go on a, a pilgrimage to find it. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So you're just going to the grocery store. I mean, really, I mean, again, for people who just really don't get it. So you go to the grocery store in some town you had never been to before. And basically, where do you head first in that grocery store? Well, always the veggies. Always go <laughs> check out what's cheap and cheerful, you know. It's my favorite part of it. Um, and then pretty much it's lovely doing the whole food plant-based thing because you can skip two, three aisles where they've got all the confectionery and all the Coca-Cola and all the other nasty stuff. And usually, yeah, it's the veggies and like the tins and, of beans and legumes and stuff like that. And maybe some of the bulk foods like your nuts and your oats and stuff like that. Um, and then otherwise, head to the chiller counter, get yourself some kombucha and some tofu. Like tofu is my, I love my tofu. <laughs> Actually, my, Georgie uh, is making for us tonight what he calls these little tofu sticks. Uh, we actually found them at one of our favorite vegan restaurants here. And they call them like fish sticks but tofu and they've got a little coating and he marinates it with some stuff and makes kind of like a tartar sauce. So yeah, we're big tofu eaters here too. Oh, lovely. So um, what time is dinner? How soon can we get <laughs> Yeah, made? I know, how far from New Zealand? Uh, I wish we could share, it would be so much fun. So, but just to continue that line, cause I'm just trying again to help people who aren't on this way of eating, vision this a little bit more so you go to that grocery store and you head to the veggies and what are the staples that you would bring back to your van give us just an um, idea generally we always stock up on you know potatoes uh some carrots usually if there's broccoli or cauliflower you know usually whatever's cheapest at the time and in season um we'll grab one of those and then 
yeah, it's pretty cruisy. Depends. We always get a um, load of leafy greens because as uh, all the doctors say, you know, you want, you know, I was at two fists full of leafy greens with almost every meal, I think it is. Um, so yeah, They're always going to give you heart health, anti-cancer health, right? Those leafy greens, sulforaphane, and they make nitric oxide, right? They do these great things. Yeah, they're just like the superfood. Yeah. Um, avocados, cool tip for um, checking avocados, rather than squeezing them, you know, you can also, um, where you see the little, like the stalk nub sort of come out, if you press that in and it goes in quite easily, that's when it's ripe, so as opposed to squeezing them all over. But yeah, avocados, always grab a few of those because we love our avo toast and stuff. I know it's probably not the healthiest, but I've lost the weight now. <laughs> I can eat myself as many avos as I like, I say, but <laughs> I'll get back so to the other So actually, stage. let me ask you about that. So are you finding that in this new trim body of yours, do you have to like be careful, you know, about certain things, you know, throughout the day? Or is that not really an issue for you? How does that work for you? No, like, um, yeah, I, I'm a really cruisy dude. If I was any more uh, laid back, I'd be on the floor. Um, it's just, I, I think that's the thing. When you're eating the right food, it doesn't matter so much how much of it you're eating. You know, you can eat as much leafy greens as you really want. And um, for me, I'm, I'm a big guy. I still have reasonably big portions. I'm, I might have double what Jackie has sometimes. Um uh, but I found that it doesn't make too much of a difference now that I've lost that that main sheer weight. I tend I've been staying around you know 87 kilo now for quite a while. It's just you know we're just having that basic you know 30 minutes to an hour walking and eating the right stuff. Weight's not a problem for me now. It's only if I get back into things like Oreos like I did the last couple of weeks that uh, you know it's like getting a bit more chubs on me again and you know, going back to the plants, then it, it drops off again. It, you know, it keeps me at that nice, 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 healthy plane. Yeah, right. Well, I right. As long as you stay away from that, you know, vegan processed junk food, right? Then you just take a stick with the plants and, and you're careful about how much fat you put on things. I mean, that's usually the issue for people is the fat and the sugar that they're adding to stuff. So if you keep it very minimal, you, you should yeah. do good. I am a devil for doing a lot of peanut butter sauces, tahini based sauces. And I know that those are all they're the good fats, you know, but um, yeah, we got into a stage where, you know, I was making all these different variations of it and it was just peanut, 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 you know, for just weeks on end. And that's when it started, you know, like we started thinking, mm, maybe we should tailor it back a bit. So we just give it a week's break and then come back to it. So um, do you guys do spring rolls at all dipped in peanut butters? sauce oh i would love to do that we've done um a few of the uh the rice paper rolls and stuff like that the problem is with jackie being c like trying to get um uh like the Glute, the, the rolls gluten-free rolls and stuff like that to I do thought it the, the rice wrappers i thought they're usually gluten-free oh well yeah the rice ones are um just with those ones we always end up doing these big fat ones and um I, I really have not mastered that one yet. They always look absolutely awful. They look like, um, well, I won't, I won't right, say Jared. what they look like. <laughs> yeah. I got the tip for you. You got a happy vegan couple YouTube channel and you'll see a, one of the videos we did recently was Georgie making spring rolls. And he'll show you step by step. He does it very well. It took him a little bit of practice initially, but he was able to get it. So actually, that video has got so many views. It's like kind of amazing to us. But uh, it, 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 maybe it'll help. So uh, the other thing I'm curious about is <clears throat> when you guys started eating this way, did it have any effect with friends or family i don't know how you know that works in your life because you guys are traveling a lot but were there any issues with that well um as you say yeah we we're traveling so i didn't have a lot of like you know close connection with a lot of my friends and stuff um with my mum at first um we rescued a, a lamb where we were in southland and uh often on facebook you know we put up a, a, a photo of our rescue sheep casper and she would say, you know, um, mm, mint sauce, you know, and sort of give a few prods, you know, and try and wind us up a little bit. But just, you know, I didn't really engage back, you know, I'd just be like, ah, great mum, you know, good on ya. Um, and in the end, you know, she just took notice of what we're eating and 
as Dr. Clapper says, you know, it's so important to set an example. And in the end, my mom has gone vegan as well. And she's. Oh my gosh, that. really? Your mom went vegan? Yeah. And she's full into and the you, whole food you, and, and you influenced her to do that? Yeah, like um, it was wonderful to see it because as I say, she was giving us um, flack at the start and now she's uh, someone who does a lot of the research. So she knows more about all the plant-based doctors um, than I do. She loves Dr. Pam Popper and um, some of the other ones like that. And yeah, she just saw what we, and she saw, you know, the fact that I was losing weight, I was looking healthier. Um, I was a lot more active from doing this. So she thought, you know, it's worth a try and yeah, she got into it and now she, she's full blown and it annoys my brother a bit. Now that's where there is a bit of tension. Um, I, I spoke to him a couple of days ago and with my grandfather passing away, you know, I ended up saying how, you know, I, I went vegan because of dementia and stuff like that. You know, I wanted to prevent that in myself and my brother got a bit he said it was a load of rubbish these things and i said well where's your bloody research and <laughs> yeah we had, we had a bit of a heated word about that but it was it's all sort of settled and cool now but you know that my brother's been one who's been a little bit um hesitant but you know we'll get him in time you know i'm always saying to mum, you know you know it, it just give us time you know we'll get him we'll get him eventually Ho hopefully, to... hopefully so that he can live a healthy life too. Tell me, did your mom experience any health benefits when she's transitioned? Yeah, well, she lost um, quite a bit of weight too. She was nowhere <laughs> near as overweight as I was. Um, but, you know, she, you can just see it in people's faces, you know, they're just so much brighter, you know, and she has this happy, healthy glow about her. Um, yeah, she just, she just really started to flourish again. And, we actually, because um, we sold our house um, to live on the road. And so mum ended up following suit in that as well. She was like, well, I'm going to do better for my health, you know, and I want to do better for my life. So she sold up her house and she decided to buy a big motor home and go on the road too. So um, <laughs> my brother's the black sheep in the family because he's conventional. <laughs> well, we all have our journeys, you know, and, and again, who knows, you know, what's ahead for him as he continues to see the both of you flourish. And, you know, hopefully not have health crises, you know, as you start aging. So who knows? So I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> something that you said earlier, which I thought was very interesting. And that was about, you said, you know, it's actually much easier for me to stick with this plant-based diet because of my vegan ethics. And uh, that was very interesting comment you made. So I'd like you to share a little bit more about that. And also, you know, I think from your story that maybe you didn't have that vegan ethic initially the way you do now, um, or maybe I'm wrong about that. So kind of clue us in on all of that. Where did that come from? And, you know, and what does that really do for you? Yeah, well, um, I grew up, you know, Mum taught me and my brother about, you know, knowing where your meat came from. You know, she taught me how to go and catch rabbits and skin them and cook them and all sorts. And I'd always sort of grown up with that thing and doing a bit of small hunting and stuff. And so when I first went plant-based, you know, the ethics weren't a big concern for me so much because, you know, I'd been part of those industries, you know, I'd worked in butcher shops cleaning up and, you know, it was a health that reeled me in. And I, I never understood the argument previously about being, people say you can, you've got to be vegan for the animals and there's no other way to be vegan. I think there's a lot of arguments that come up about it because of the semantics of, you know, it was health that led me to become vegan, um, but now I'm vegan <laughs> for the animals. And it's just having those ethics, as I was saying earlier, it just seeing it for what it is you know i'm not gonna slip up and eat a cheeseburger you know i'm not gonna uh, i used to get flack from uh one of the the groundskeepers we used to stay um well we used to camp up at he used to say you know oh the missus isn't around you know you can go sneak off and get a pie but i'm not gonna go and do that because i recognize now that you know it was a living being someone had to suffer for that and not only someone had to suffer for that i'm gonna make myself suffer for eating that as well and just having those those ethics just to back it up and really keep you on that that healthier track because we know that this whole food plant based way of eating the even just plant based even if you are having some of the junk and stuff like that it's so much healthier it's so much better and just 
yeah, the ethics are a really good way sort of to, to keep you in there. And once you start understanding the plight um, that a lot of these animals are going through, I, I personally, I can't bring myself to go back on that. You know, even through these last few weeks, which have been incredibly hard for me, um, my worst thing was eating Oreos and drinking too much beer. You know, and I'd much rather be doing that than, you know, killing something through my eating habits um, because of that. Um, but, uh, let me just ask you, how did you get to that point, though? I mean, that's so interesting to hear that in your younger life, you know, you were doing some hunting and you actually, you know, were killing animals and doing what you needed to do to eat them. So you had all that in you. How did you get to that other place? I mean, you know, to really incorporate that into you. Well, um, I think we all never stop learning. And so is that the, the start when I started watching, you know, What the Health and I started watching some of the other documentaries. Um, they, they just started. I haven't watched Earthlings or Dominion, um, which are two of the big ones, you know. Um, you but, know, I can't, I, what I've read about Earthlings is that a lot of people, they put it on and they're sobbing, you know, and then they have to shut it off. Uh, so I always, I say to people, look, if you really want to be plant-based, but you're like a cheeseaholic or you can't give up your cravings for barbecue, if you really want to help animals, watch Earthlings. But I don't think I could ever sit through that myself. No. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. Um, I keep saying one day I'll get around to watching it, but um, just through some of the other films, they started giving more of an insight about what's really happening within the industry. And it just got me thinking about some of my past experiences. And as I was saying earlier, I used to go and catch rabbits. And I remember, I remember at the start of the sort of plant-based vegan journey, I just sort of had that flashback to one of the times that I went hunting and they had um, the disease myxomatosis come up in my local area back in Wales. And basically that renders the, the rabbits blind and deaf and they slowly mm -hmm. choke to death. It's a horrible thing. And so I used to go up onto the mountain and where I was usually hunting them, I'd then see them going around blind and deaf. And it, it was so horrible and heartbreaking to see. And you go off and you just go finish them off um, to be merciful for them. And I would just remember just in the back of my head, there was just, just something saying, this isn't quite right, you know. Ah, oh, but, you know, we're manly and I'm hunting and I'm doing this stuff for me, you know. And, you know, you 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 try and reason it and you're trying to say, you know, like, no, this is the right thing. But there was always that part of me in the back of my head, that was, this isn't quite right. And yeah, it was just through the learning more about, you know, the effects that the meat has and what's going, what's going on in the industry to create that product in the first place. It just started sparking off those old memories and me looking at them in a different light, because that's the thing I'm as much as I don't like what I used to do. I, I'm still glad that I've done things so I can understand them better. And then it means that when I'm approaching other people who are still eating meat, you know, I can re level with them because I understand it. I was there too. You know, we've all slept that sleep. Um, as Dr. Clapper recently said, you know, we've all been there. I, I have those experiences. I have those knowledges and that's what's helped me to be a more compassionate being now because I can really understand it firsthand. Yeah, you know, and I, I would agree for me, you know, as I said, I became a vegetarian quite young, 21 or 22, because I knew I didn't want to hurt animals. And that was my motivation. But I kept eating dairy. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I kept it. Uh, it wasn't until I was 60 when I watched Forks Over Knives and it was the very next day that I gave up the dairy and the eggs and became whole food plant-based. But you know, it's interesting to me that for all those decades of my life, I never picked up the knowledge about like how dairy cows suffer and how, you know, the, the whole laying hen and industry, how that makes the chickens suffer and, you know, what happened to the baby chicks and all of that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I never really integrated into my head. So I understand what you're saying. You know, it is a journey for most of us. We're not born into this lifestyle. Some people, they are, you know, but most of us in the past haven't. So we have to get there somehow. And, uh, you know, some of us are faster and some of us are slower, but, you know, hopefully 
you know, once we understand the knowledge and the learning, you know, our compassion and our heart can take over. Yeah. It's, um, as you're talking about with dairy, um, my wife, she was a dairy farmer for 18 years and she was vegetarian for most of that time because she made that connection about, you know, slaughtering a cow for beef. But despite milking 200 cows, you know, it just shows how much the cognitive distance dissident <laughs> yeah. is ingrained in us and especially when you're you know she married into that industry with a previous husband and you know um she was put in a position where that was like the, the the job she had to do and you know she was so ingrained that she didn't make that connection with dairy and now you know she's doing everything she can to speak out against that industry but dairy in particular for me it's the worst because we've just normalized it so much we've made it so that Everyone thinks it's okay, but it's so harmful for the animals and um, humans too. We should not be drinking that stuff. We shouldn't be eating it. I, the thing that really um, gets me is it's a food that melts. There's no other foods really apart from maybe chocolate that um, sort of melts, well, especially something that melts and goes gooey. It's not a texture. It's not a property that should naturally be happening with our foods. It means something's gone wrong. <laughs> Right. Well, and it, I mean, again, and most people don't think about it. Like, I think Dr. Clapper likes to share this a lot. It's breast milk, cow breast milk. I mean, why are human beings drinking the breast milk of another animal? It's, it's, if you really think about it. But I would like to just ask you again, because I, I, I know you're very passionate you know, now about your vegan ethics and, and all the learning that you have about animal suffering. And you know, when you talk about, because a lot of people, you know, I'll meet, they're, still, they're vegetarians. They can't make that last little change to all plant-based. And, you know, what are just a few of the facts that you've learned about, you know, the suffering that dairy cows go through? Could you just, you know, I don't want to talk too long about it because uh, we're going to wind up soon, but just a few of the, you know, the biggest things that you know that, you know, make a difference. Well, um, it sounds silly saying it, but cows have to be pregnant in order to produce the milk. And um, I feel silly in saying it because everyone should know that, but there's actually a lot of people who don't realize that a child has to be taken from the mother in order for that milk to be available for us to eat it. And with Jackie working on the dairy farm, she had cows there who had been on there for about, I don't know, 16, 17 years. You know, they got to live out um, almost the whole life expectancy, which was very rare. This was maybe one or two cows on the entire farm. But the thing is they had had 13, 14 children taken away from them, you know? And so these cows go through this torment every year, you know, they're constantly having their children taken away from them. If they aren't slaughtered as bobby calves and that often people think bobby calves are just male calves, but they can also be female calves, which have, you know, maybe the wrong genetics, the wrong genes. Um, New Zealand is a country that is very proud of its dairy and stuff. And we like to show people that it's all clean, green, rolling hills. But in essence, it's a outdoor factory farm. We do so many things to these cows, which is all for profit. Um, Jackie was even asked by one of her previous bosses um, to cut some of the, the teats off of the cows with just scissors, no antiseptic, because he wanted the perfect udders, you know, rather than having seven, he wanted six teats on it. So they do bizarre things like that. And like um, docking cow's tail, fortunately they've stopped doing, um, oh, what's the name for it? Um, oh, it's escaped me now. And Jackie's left the room. <laughs> but when they, um, they get the cows to give birth earlier, um, Oh, sorry, I can't remember the word for it. But basically, they used to give the cows an injection in order to basically get the, the calf earlier so they all calve in time. And basically, a lot of these calves would come out and they wouldn't be fully formed yet. And the farmers would have to go and just hit them over their heads. Um, oh, my gosh. I never, even, I never even heard of that. I didn't know that. Wow. There is yeah. so much horrible stuff that happens. Jackie is doing her best now to speak out about it. She's just uh, talked recently for VegFest UK, which will hopefully be getting shared soon. Um, but there's so many practices, you know, with, um, with with what they do to the cows, what they do to the cows, and just that endless torment, you know. They just, they don't, it's the most wretched life, you know. You think uh, the beef cows and stuff have it bad, but 
the dairy cows just get interfered with constantly. You know, it's milking every day, you know, two, three times in a lot of places. They have to walk for miles in order to get to the milking shed to then be crammed in. A lot of the farmers, you know, they're not too kind to them. Jackie was, you know, she was someone who was nice to her cows, but she didn't even get the the, the connection, you know, because it, it was it was forced out of her to have that connection. But cows in the dairy industry have it the worst of all, you know, when it comes to, um, or when it comes to some of these big mammals, you know, I know chickens and everyone else has really bad time, but dairy cows, we got to end dairy. That, that's one of our missions at the moment is, is trying to bring it down as much as we can in New Zealand because it is abhorrent. And, you know, you said about that the cows, you know, have to, uh, they're tormented, their children, their, their babies are taken away after they're born. And I've heard that um, when the baby gets taken away, the cows actually respond in an emotional way, the way they can respond. Uh, do you know anything about that yourself that Jackie yeah. might have shared with you? Yeah, they, um, they will cry for days. They are very distraught, you know, like any, any, anybody, you know, you take your baby, someone takes your baby away, you're gonna be, even if someone came and took your cat away, you're gonna be distraught. You know, and people don't realize the emotional intelligence that these um, cows have. And what they'll do is they'll get the, the newborn calf and they'll chuck them in the trailer. And then the cows will, will chase. They will follow that trailer until they are forced, you know, apart. And often, you know, they take the, the calves off into a barn so that then the human can look after them, you know, feed them and decide whether they're going on the bobby truck or whether, the, you know, they're going to get... Um, abuse for for the rest of their life instead um but yeah so they they really they they will bellow they will bellow for days and it just absolutely breaks their hearts you know it's, yeah you know um, one of the things that you know i think a lot about is you know people have such love and compassion for their pets their dogs their cats you know those are the main domestic pets here in the states and uh you know, people, if they have the resources, if their animal gets sick, they'll go spend for surgery and all these things. And yet, you know, they do all that. And then there's none of this vision towards the other animals, like what you're sharing about the cows and the, the mama cow bellowing and crying for days about their baby being taken away. And I'm like, if somebody's dog or cat was crying for days, you know, they would be they wouldn't know what to do. They would be so sad, right? Yeah, I think a lot of us have seen those videos online, you know, like a dog loses its puppy and it, it, it will cry, you know, and it will, when you have like two companion animals and one of them passes away, you can see how distraught, you know, they are. I like to, you know, when it comes to cows, you know, they're like big bovine puppies. You know, they are really sweet and affectionate animals. They build um, relationships, they have friends, they have a hierarchy. Um, Jackie used to tell me about how in the milk and shed, they know exactly which store they're going to go into because that's the hierarchy and they've got their friends there and they have their little social groups, you know, not that we can understand what on earth they're going to be talking about. I don't know if it's a weather or local politics, but <laughs> you know, they're so it's, it's incredible. Um, the amount of emotional depth that they have. And it's so sad that there's never a happy ending to, um, a dairy cow's life and going to the vet thing. Um, they'd use, you know, vets if, it meant keeping the cow alive in order to make the profit, you know, but there are so many cases where cows get, you know, hit on the head, you know, they get bludgeoned um, because, you know, it's not worth saving them, you know, oh, while well, the cow fell down in the ditch, broke its leg, oh yeah, we'll just shoot it, you know, and there's no happy ending. And even the dairy cows, most of them, you know, they'll do, they'll do, I don't know, maybe three, four years of, of actually producing milk, you know, and if their milk level starts dropping, it's like, nah, we'll chuck you on the truck. We'll get that one slaughtered, you know, bring in the next one it's um no right it's very anything. different from the pictures on the milk cartons or the ice cream whatever when they're trying to make like you alluded earlier oh everything is beautiful they're out here in the hills they have a great life no mm -hmm. no you know i actually had my first real cow experience actually about a couple months ago because i grew up in a big city for most of my life. So I was never around farm animals, okay? But now I'm in a different place and I went to a lake a few months ago. It was like my only outing with COVID going on because I've been actually isolating. 
because of my age. And uh, so amazingly, around this lake, there was a shoreland and we had some lunch there. And there was a whole group of cows that we found that lived there. And so again, I don't have experience around animals like that. So we, we went and started approaching the cows and one of them started approaching us. And at first I was like nervous. I'm like this big animal. I mean, it wasn't, it was a, probably a young one, but it was still big to me. And I was like nervous that it was coming towards me. And I was like, Georgie, the cow's coming. Maybe we got to leave. He says, no, 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 they're going to be fine. But see, I didn't know this. And so he went and started to, the cow actually came very close and he reached and, you know, started touching it. And I was like amazed. And I, I was like, I wanted to do it too. I'd never touched a cow before, you know? And I mean, I see them, I'll travel around and I'll see the cows. And usually what I'm doing, when I see the cows, you know, out in a pasture somewhere as I'm driving, I'm just like, oh, I'm just so sorry that somebody's going to hurt you. You know, it's just like, I can't stand to know that that's going to be the life. But anyways, so I started touching the cow and I just couldn't believe it. It was like, it was just like amazing to me. I started scratching its head. And then I started trying to touch by the nose and it was just staying there. And I was like, this is like a dog. That is how I felt, you know? And I think when I first became a vegetarian at my young age, it was probably because I had a dog when I was a kid and I love that dog. And that dog was so special to me. And I, I guess I just made that connection that an animal is an animal. And I didn't want to make all these, I, there was like, I, I don't know, you know, why people have all the divisions, but for some reason that didn't work for me. So yes, cows, like you say, they're cuddly like dogs mm -hmm. and people don't recognize that. And it's, you know, they just kill them and rip anyways. So tell me, Gareth, cause this I know is a big part of you. When you start like talking to somebody maybe new about you and what you're into, do you start with the vegan ethic or do you start with health or how do you approach it with people? It generally depends on the person that you're talking to. Um, for me, I believe, you know, we need activism across the board. There's no one way to do it. Um, health is often one of my first ports of call because the thing is a lot of us are naturally a bit selfish, you know, we want to know what's in it for us. And so if I can tell you that I've lost all this weight, you know, I'm feeling awesome, you know, people are like, oh yeah, I want to feel good too. And um, like the caretaker I spoke about earlier, he used to give me a bit of flack about saying, you know, the miss isn't here, you can go off and have a pie. With him, humor was a really good way to get him talking. And so he'd turn up on the lawnmower and it'd be one of those ride on ones. So I say, hey, you're coming to bring me some meals on wheels, have you? And um, getting him talking about food, you know, and um, even though I'm taking the mickey out of myself saying I'm going to eat the grass, um, it just sort of depends on, it depends on the person, you know, when it's someone completely unknown, like if you're having a discussion on the street, it's, you, you have to gauge it quite fast, but you know, health or the ethics are usually my sort of two ones to go in with first, you know, the health is a very, it's, it's a nice sort of round one. It's, it's something that um, people aren't going to take offense to. Whereas when you bring up the ethical side of things, people can get very defensive, very fast. Um, but it, it can still happen with the food because no one likes to think that they're making themselves sick, you know, with what they're doing. Right. Yeah. I agree with you. That's pretty much kind of how I approach it. I mean, mostly for me, I go with the health angle. I mean, you know, and even though I started young because I didn't want to hurt animals, I agree. You know, when, if you start with that, with your average person, you might just, you know, make them feel defensive about it or, you know, anybody else in their family eating animals. And then we really can't go anywhere. And there's just such other great reasons. I mean, there's the health and then of course there's the climate and the planet, right? Those reasons too. Are, are you, you know, invested in that other area of <clears throat> great reasons to go plant-based? Yeah, well, uh, personally, I believe, you know, it's all one big wheel, you know, and it is all, all attached by different spokes, you know, and I think it's great, you know, whatever reason someone wants to go towards a plant-based, a whole food plant-based, a vegan diet, it's great, you know, it doesn't matter if it's for the environment. Um, I recently went down to protest the live export here in Napier, where we're currently staying. Uh, they're sending 7,000 cows out on the ship. 
And we had a few discussions with people coming by and seeing us protesting. And for me, I started talking to people and just sort of gauging some, like some people on about um, the, the patriotic element. So in New Zealand, we have all these animal welfare things and we like to be the dairy country. Well, if I can get someone to stop supporting this exploitation by saying, you know, you're being unpatriotic, you know, it's um, by sending them off to China where they're just going to, you know, they're recreating our industry out there. You know, the industry I want to destroy, don't get that wrong. But, you know, um, I don't think it matters what reason you, you go towards this diet. You know, it all just matters that you go towards it and you stick to it. And so, yeah, I think, you know, use anything in your toolbox to get people on board, really. Right. So I understand um, you're involved in some other projects with filming and with activism around uh, veganism and plant-based eating. So tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Yeah, well, I work for uh, Vegan FTA, as you might be able to see on the little light box up in the corner. But um, And what does yeah, FTA I, stand for? For the animals. So we're vegan for the animals and we are a global nonprofit, which, you know, we're, we're, we're dedicated towards veganism and we do a lot of focus on activism. And recently since COVID uh, came about, we started doing zoom chats like this with different activists from around the world. And I've now we've got, we're on to episode, I think eight or nine at the moment. We've got a whole first season of 20 episodes filmed about hour long, interviews and we've done uh, dr clapper he was absolutely wonderful um the most excited i've ever been for a doctor's visit <laughs> um we've sp spoken to patrick baboomian uh, from game changers he is they're also lovely people um i mean tell yeah. what he's famous for because not everybody's going to know his name uh so patrick baboom he's one of the he's well i think he's he's probably one of the world's strongest vegans he was um Germany's strongest man and he's he's done all these world strongman titles and stuff he is an absolute unit um people know him from game changers for him saying how um how That's can you be a strong the movie the movie yeah the game, game changers movie right. um from saying that you can't be as strong as an ox by eating one you know <laughs> you got to eat what the ox is eating but uh, yeah we we talked to people like that but also Jerry Carbstrong as I mentioned earlier the Australian activist who's very prominent on YouTube um We've got Earthling Ed hopefully signed up for season two. We've got Captain Paul Watson still to interview. Uh, we've got an interview with Dr. Gregor coming. It's just a really great series where we talk to these people and try and get some of their insights into having these conversations, you know, talking about veganism, talking about some of their experiences. Um, one fantastic one we've got is Katrina Fox, and she does uh, Vegan Business Media. Uh, that's her website, and she does the, the vegan... I'm probably going to get this wrong, but it's the Vegan Women's Leadership Network. And that's all about empowering women to do uh, different things, whether it's, you know, business and getting out there and really being a strong um, female role model with veganism and stuff. We talked to all these wonderful people and they all give their little snippets of information and knowledge. And I really hope some people go and watch those episodes because myself and Jackie, we host it and we've learned so much through it and they just have so much wonderful insights on how we can go forward and we can be a better advocates for the animals, you know, and, and the plus side is, you know, when we talk to people like Dr. Clapper, um, a bit more on the nutritional side of things too. And just so we, we can be better vegans out there. And so how do people access these interviews? They sound wonderful. So you can either check out vegan FTA on Facebook. We are on mm -hmm. YouTube and we have uh, the website veganfta.com. So you can go to either of these and we'll have links to the episodes wherever it is. We're also on Instagram as well. I think that's at vegan FTA. And yeah, basically if you search vegan FTA, uh, Google will probably say, did you mean vegan feta? But no, you want vegan FTA. And um, yeah, the videos are up there and just look for activist. And yeah, we've got, we've got plenty of the episodes up there. We even have some other, ones about sanctuaries and some of the animal stories and also some food ones. I did a series called Eat the Change, which was about uh, some of the New Zealand eateries out here. One in particular I can recommend is Plant Blaze because they are, they do the best food. Wow, well, that's just so exciting and wonderful that you're immersed in all of this. So tell me, I mean, you're a young guy and you're all into this, you know, do you feel optimism that, you know, as we, 
move on as you age a little bit that more and more people are are going to understand the value and you know all the wonderful reasons for going plant-based and do you think we'll get more people on board and really be able to make a difference for our planet our health the animals you know what's your feeling about that yeah i i really truly believe that <laughs> we're, we're going to get there you know it might not come as fast as we would like, but I, I think, you know, we're making huge steps. The, the way veganism has grown, even just in the last three years when I've been vegan is, is incredible. And the fact that places like Burger King, McDonald's, not that I personally choose to give them any of my money, um, but the fact that they're even doing some vegan options, even if it is more for the flexitarians and stuff like that, something <laughs> I'm not going to go into flexitarians, but um, yeah, yeah. The fact that we're getting them to put things on their menus, you know, the fact that there's so many more vegan options out there is absolutely fantastic. And I think it's so important that for us to get there, collaboration is key. So if people are vegan businesses, we need to work together. We all need to be doing what we can in our own different way. Um, and that's something that we try to encourage in Vegan FTA and our activist series is you know, we're not all going to do activism in the same way. We're not all going to get to the same place from the same path, but you know, whatever, whatever is right for you, you do that. For me, it's film and photography for someone. It might be drawing for, for my wife. It's writing. We all have different paths, but we're all making it there. So the more of us who can get on board, the sooner it's going to happen. We're going to have a healthier, happier world. And it's just going to be wonderful. Right. I, I so agree. So we're going to, we're going to wrap this up. I think I'm just two more things I want to ask you just one to kind of sum it up a little bit <clears throat> excuse me it, like if you were going to give somebody a real quick you know this is why it'd be so great to go whole food plant-based you know like your little elevator speech you know you don't have much time kind of what would you share with somebody you know oh that's a difficult one that's on the spot now but um <laughs> I guess, you know, if, if you want to truly be, be healthy, you want to be at the top of your game, eat what, you, what you've been eating has been eating, you know, go straight to the source, skip out that middleman. You know, we all want to be in control of our lives, you know, and by eating everything fresh from the source, you know, you just, you're right there. You are in control. You're not having to deal with anybody else. You know, it's all, you just got to make the right decisions for yourself and that might come at different times, but peak nutrition is whole food plant-based. You know, the research is there. I just got to tell people to do the research for themselves. Really just check them out, have an open mind. You know, you may not like this one, but check out another one. You know, it's, it was all about the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, but just, if you want to be healthy, whole food, plant-based, you know, no oil. <laughs> right. And I'm just going to share your picture again, because <clears throat> just to remind people of like, you know, what you've come from, let me just show these pictures one more time about how you have just made this great transition for yourself. And look at that. So that's, again, this is how Gareth made this wonderful change. I'm just going to show those other little pictures too. And uh, his adorable wife, Jackie. I mean, you just see all the happiness emanating from her. But of course, you were still not quite slimmed down. And even in the picture after the book, like you are now, you know, as we can see there on the right. So, um, yeah, who ate all the pies? It was me. <laughs> yeah. When you say pies, are you talking about like meat, the old kind, the meat pies versus yeah. the pure pies, right? Because I a lot of our people, listeners, they probably are thinking, you know, in America, we use the word pie usually for dessert. But I know like, you know, the UK version, which is what I'm thinking you're doing, is more like the meat pie. New Zealand takes it one step further and one step worse. Um, yeah, it's meat pies, but they tend to have like, uh, it'll be like beef mints and gravy with like cheese on top. So you have a mince and cheese pie, steak and cheese pie. Um, UK is a bit of a pie culture, but New Zealand, it's, it's I've never seen it anywhere else like it. Uh, you go down to any corner store, there's a little uh, pie heater there and you can just get these really cheap, horrible pies. And I, I used to eat so many of them, but... Yeah, they're generally, if you hear a uh, Kiwi, uh, New Zealander, or Australian, quite often they mean meat pies. You know, we tend not to have a lot of um, uh, dessert sort of pies and stuff like that. It's all savory. 
Right, and I bet you could make some really good ones with legumes, right? Yeah, actually, um, we had a pie maker whilst we we're whilst we we're still plant based. Since we've gone whole food plant based, we haven't been doing it a lot because of you know trying to get pastry and stuff and um, not being bothered to make it ourselves. But we had a pie maker, and so you know putting things like curry, a good vegan curry in a pie, absolutely wonderful. Um, shepherd's pie in a pie, <laughs> you can put anything. You know, a pie is just a pastry little shell. So if if you have a pie maker and you do want to gain some weight go for it just make sure it's, it's plant-based vegan but you know you can make some wonderful creations <laughs> right I, i'm sure you can well before we end i just want to give you a chance if there's anything that uh it'd still be wonderful for you to share with people if there's something we haven't covered that you think would be valuable or any you know last concluding statement go for it oh th well thank you so much for having me on this first and foremost but well, like I said earlier, um, just be an example. You know, you might have people in your life who, who struggle with you changing your lifestyle, but all you can do is just keep being you, set the example. Like I did with my mother, they may well change. You know, they see the, the happiness, they see the health come in. So just carry on with it, you know, and never stop learning with it. Um, check out Vegan FTA on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all those wonderful places and the activist series because there's so much to learn there it's just um i look forward to having more more people out there spreading the good word you know being healthier being happier and yeah just just big love to everyone out there you know <laughs> yeah and it's just i mean i just think it's so exciting you know that through the zoom we were able to kind of collaborate and sharing our excitement you know and a passion about the whole food plant-based message and the uh, the vegan value because both of us you know both share that I mean that's just, it was just so wonderful I've just enjoyed so much talking with you and I just want to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to spend this time with us and I want to wish you and Jackie you know wonderful life ahead of you and immersed in this great passion of yours and I, I know you guys are going to make a real difference and uh, you know, you're young activists and you'll keep it up, I'm sure, for decades and decades and you're going to make a real difference in the world. So I appreciate you so much and thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you so much. Okay.